Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hoda, for these kind words and for uh, welcoming us at the uh, NYU uh, Abu Dhabi. I'm very glad because it's my first visit since I, I took my functions in, uh, in Sorbonne Abu Dhabi to be there. And uh, I'm very grateful for, for you to organize this, this event this evening. And uh, I have to say that I have uh, two uh, marvelous guests uh, that, uh, and we spent part of the day today on diplomacy. So this is uh, welcome news to be able to join uh, this uh, event this evening. I, I will uh, first present uh, Jan Melissen uh, on my right. He's a senior research fellow at the Netherlands Institute of International Relations, Kligendel. Uh, he is uh, as well a senior fellow at uh, Leiden University's campus in The Hague and a professor of diplomacy at the University of Antwerp. Uh, Jan uh, held uh, various uh, management positions at uh, Kligendil for, for quite a time, I must say. And uh, most of all, he's also a faculty fellow at the Center on Public Diplomacy at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, and also in Beijing. Uh, he's very noted experts on uh, and a number of projects is run on public diplomacy, digital diplomacy, and uh, the, these projects were co-funded by various government and research councils in Europe, North America, and the Asia Pacific. So, and uh, maybe uh, I keep the, the best for the last thing is uh, <laughs> Jan co-founded the Hague Journal of Diplomacy, which is very well noted uh, journal and the leading research journal in the study of diplomacy. Turning now to our second guest is Cornelia Biola, is an uh, associate professor in diplomatic studies at the University of Oxford, is a uh, head of the Oxford uh, Digital Diplomacy Research Group. Uh, he also serves as a faculty fellow at the Center on Public Diplomacy at the USC, University of Southern California, and also a professional lecturer at the, universe, at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna, also a noted expert on, on diplomacy. Uh, his research uh, focuses on the impact of digital technology and the conduct of diplomacy uh, with a focus on strategic communications, digital influence, and methods for countering digital propaganda. So, as you can see, we, we are very uh, fortunate to welcome these two uh, very fine experts on the subject this evening is about uh, digital diplomacy in the age of social media and fake news. I will just briefly for one minute introduce them and then uh, I will give the floor to Cornelio for some slides and some uh, mm -hmm. on digital diplomacy. And then we will go on the, the panel in uh, the series of questions we will ask and then we'll give the floor to, to the public and the audience. So just as introductory words, I would say that we have many potential threats to democracy and one of them probably is uh, what has been coined as the uh, Time Magazine 2017 word of the year, fake news. But as far as I remember, I think that the already in Comedy Central, John Stewart uh, comedy show was having this fake news uh, show uh, many, many years ago. As, uh, as I remember, it was from 1999 and up to uh, 2015. Uh, and then it was Trevor Noah who took over at the Comedy Central. So fake news is almost new, but not really. Uh, what is noted and what we have to say, it's a, a global phenomenon really now. And, and this is uh, very important to try to understand a bit better uh, uh, what the, the term, the phrase is adding to, to a lot of things. So first of all, I, I would like to give the floor to, to Cornelio to present uh, some slides on the digital media and precisely, I guess, on something that is connected to the influence uh, on uh, uh, diplomacy. Thank you very much, Eric. It's, um, and thank you very much uh, to the house for uh, inviting us uh, to this uh, um, uh, session on, on, uh, on a topic which I think it's, uh, has become has exploded in the uh, past few years. It's, it's interesting, as Eric mentioned, uh, the concept, the idea of fake news is not completely new. It started to get out of proportion after the US election in 2016. But the concept, interestingly, you know, uh, uh, goes back, uh, of course, you know, much uh, 
much uh, uh, back in, into history. I, um, I visited today the amazing Louvre Museum here in Abu Dhabi. And I was struck, for instance, by the painting, the famous painting of Napoleon, very heroically on the back of his uh, horse, you know, crossing into Italy. And then, you know, probably people uh, don't know uh, the fact that uh, uh, he was crossing it into Italy on the back of a mule. So there was a bit of, of, of a fake news even at that time. Uh, uh, June 19, uh, 1897, a famous American writer, Mark Twain, there were reports uh, in New York press uh, that he was dying in poverty in London. Hence, you know, his famous uh, quip that, you know, the, the news of my death have been uh, greatly exaggerated. So we have uh, this, this uh, succession of, of fake news. But there is something interesting in the sense that in the digital era, era in the digital age, uh, fake news seems to uh, have exploded. And uh, part of my research is to try to understand what exactly is new in the digital that makes the phenomenon of fake news and also of uh, digital disinformation so uh, uh, significant. Um, so what is new? Um, and I think uh, we started to get worried uh, basically on this particular issue after the US elections. And why so? When you think about it, um, uh, there were congressional hearings in uh, January 90, um, uh, 2017 when the big um, uh, tech companies uh, were invited to testify in front of the US Congress about what happened during the US elections. And why initially, especially Facebook said, well, you know, nothing too much I mean, in terms of the, the impact. Uh, I said, well, I don't think, you know, what Zuckerberg said that, you know, people have been exposed to that too much. Actually, after that, they confessed that about, so up to 150 million people have been exposed to those toxic uh, uh, advertisements uh, coming from a particular uh, troll factory. Putting that into context is quite interesting because why well, up to 150 million have been exposed to that, the people um, you know, watching traditional media, um, um, the, the proportion of people watching traditional media was much, much lower. So you get a sense a bit about you know, the magnitude of the issue. Um, I'm, I'm going to caution it, and I'm going to get back to this. The fact that people are exposed to fake news doesn't mean that they then change political opinion automatically. It's a more complex relationship. Uh, we, uh, we know also from a study that was done by um, uh, my university, University of Toronto when I graduated, uh, that the phenomenon is quite significant in terms of how this uh, uh, deliberate act of uh, uh, extracting information and then selectively promoting it um, has taken a global dimension. And that's uh, a study that uh, was done at the Monk Center um, and uh, speaks a little bit about the procedure, how these kind of uh, uh, particular influencers in, political area, in the political sphere, in the military sphere, uh, information is being extracted and then uh, presented in a particular way in order to compromise a political position or a, 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 or a personality. So there is a, lot, a little bit about that. We um, know, for instance, uh, that other platforms have been exposed. LinkedIn is the last one. There was a report done by the German intelligence uh, claiming that information has been extracted also from German citizens, allegedly by the Chinese intelligence services. So there is something in terms of how these platforms have now become, because of the data that they contain, a medium for, uh, of interest uh, for, uh, for many. So the question is also, what exactly is happening? And I think this is a, a question that we have to ask in the context of the digital medium. And we, uh, when we look, um, uh, comparing what is happening today, comparing with what happened uh, 50 years or 60 years ago, I think there are certain elements that makes this process particularly uh, unique. It's about the amount of data that is being now accumulated and disseminated online. It's about the speed, the velocity with which this data is being uh, uh, communicated or transmitted. Um, and also about the new features that come with the digital media, which we discover as we go about. Let me very quickly go uh, over some of the issues. So what we know is that at the moment, a lot of these platforms that we've seen nowadays is about Facebook, it's about uh, Twitter, it's about uh, YouTube. Uh, there are million, billions of people already subscribing, and we know that, uh, using this platform. In a, uh, in a, in a, so the amount of people already on platform is particularly significant. Um, there is increase, and I'm mentioning this because WhatsApp 
as you probably uh, follow the news, WhatsApp is becoming the next conduit, um, uh, probably, you know, for, for uh, disinformation and the use of fake news. If you follow the news, for instance, in India and some other places, quite a, a, a powerful one. Uh, but it's not only the number of users that are exposed to, um, uh, or, you know, that can be reached by digital media, but also the amount of data that is being circulated. Um, uh, the former CEO of Google mentioned, for instance, in 2013, that we now produce, and that was something, we now produce the same equivalent of data in two days as much as the entire uh, humanity produced from the dawn of time until 2013. And the process is accelerating. So on one hand, you have a lot of, of users already present on this digital platform. On the other hand, it's also the sheer amount of data that is being uh, developed. You have also to keep in mind that we are talking about this phenomenon because of the 3G technology, the one that was uh, created and generated. Uh, uh, we have this kind of social apps and because of this, but uh, 5G is coming next year. And I think it's important to take that on board because the amount of data is going to multiply by a factor of 30. So usually, the statistics shows that we use on an individual uh, basis about 3 giga per month of data. With 5G, it's expected that amount that we use on our phones and computers is, is, uh, is expected to increase to 90 giga. So more data that is going to become available through uh, the new generation of uh, communication. So why is this important? Why this sheer amount of data changes the context? Because for us, as individuals, that creates a problem. How do we absorb this information? We have the same brain, same, the same capacity, and we develop, in a sense, you know, cognitive uh, uh, shortcuts. So the first thing that we've seen with the digital is what I call the transition from uh, uh, Gutenberg to Zuckerberg, from text to the visual. It's one way in which we try to select from the various types of uh, uh, type of data that comes or reaches us, uh, and the visual uh, um, uh, plays a big role into that. There was another interesting statistic saying that 1985, comparing with today, we absorb <coughs> five times more information on a daily basis, which means that from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, you basically read a book to the type of information that reaches you from the phone, from the computer, from the street, the signs of the streets. So there is a lot of information that we have to process. The visual helps us with this. We uh, retain better the type of information that is presented to us uh, visually, and also we remember that easier, more easily. Uh, so that's, that's something in the terms of the visual that uh, matters a lot. And when you look at statistics, we realize that this is happening. People, when they share online, what they share mainly, they share pictures. So the visual has become one element in which the transmission of information online uh, um, happens much, much faster. But um, a second factor, which I think is particularly interesting that we started to learn about the digital medium, is not only the fact that uh, the visual matters, it's also the fact that the way in which the messages and the way in which messages travel online are very much driven by emotions. So this is something interesting, right? When we have a conversation here or, you know, outside, it's, it's based on the idea that we engage with each other, uh, that we make certain type of arguments, that we refer to facts, but now in the medium, and that's something that uh, probably we started to, 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 to become more aware uh, in the past three, uh, three years, that emotion actually shaped the way in which we process, absorb, and process this information. There was an interesting study that a few years ago in which they tried to look exactly at this. Uh, what kind of messages, in terms of the, uh, the emotional load, travel faster? And they look at anger, at joy, sadness, and disgust. And this study showed that actually messages that sort of are framed or inspire anger, travel the fastest. And to a certain extent, that, that uh, uh, makes you think about you know, the, the, the what, you know, connection with what happened in the past few years and the way in which these kind of messages uh, go about. Uh, and there is support for that. Uh, the point uh, here 
is that uh, uh, the way in which emotions frame the content of these messages um, uh, has very much to do with this uh, uh, idea that uh, emotions, in a sense, serve as a heuristic by which we select appropriate information, but also by the way in which we absorb it. Um, the, um, the valence uh, arousal dominance model speaks exactly about this. Um, there are different emotions, and when you look at them, for instance, uh, the, the valence speaks about the value or the positive or negative character of the emotion. Uh, sadness is a negative value, right? Joy is a positive one. So, in a sense, you know, that distinguishes qualitatively between emotions. Uh, when you speak about arousal, is the what the emotions make you, uh, uh, energize you, or on the, on the contrary, uh, make you basically uh, um, curl yourself, you know, and then and, and, and be inactive. Um, the dominance aspect is about which emotions gives you a sense of control, of better understanding of how these uh, actions uh, uh, can take place. So when you look at them, you know, again, anger, it's up there in terms of the, uh, of the combinations. And we've seen, again, when you look at the statistics on social media, that indeed uh, these this, uh, this, uh, uh, elements of... Um, anger and uncivility or hostility online have become more and more pregnant. So um, we have emotions, we have the role of data that I think is particularly important, the role of the visuals, the role of emotions, and there is one more factor that structures and plays a big role in the way in which this uh, uh, problem of disinformation takes place. It's what uh, the role of algorithm. When we talk here, algorithm basically um, um, uh, when we talk here face-to-face, uh, -face, we can see each other, <clears throat> we can communicate with each other directly. The algorithms work differently. The algorithms uh, from, uh, from the entire room, I can basically talk, for instance, only with this group because I share more their tweets or uh, posts. I interacted more often. I gave a like to those. Uh, <coughs> so it presents to me a particular group from the entire uh, 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 arena. So the algorithm, in a sense, connects exactly these building blocks uh, that I mentioned in terms of dissemination. So there is a filter here that we have to keep in mind. And an example that is particularly interesting here, in which cognitive biases and algorithms actually work together, is uh, from an incident that happened in, uh, in, um, in Toronto earlier this year. And there, was an, uh, there were two tweets that a researcher has uh, passed. Uh, one was more uh, uh, neutral in, in content. The other one was more um, <coughs> uh, uh, problematic, uh, frame, pro emotionally framed. And you can see how these two combinations come into place basically to promote a particular story more aggressively and more effectively. So the cognitive biases are amplified by the role of algorithm. This is one aspect that I think uh, particularly, uh, has found particularly, uh, to be particularly relevant in the case of dissemination of fake news. And finally, one uh, last point that we learned about the digital, and that has come up with the, the, the issue of Cambridge Analytica, if you follow the, that story, is about the role of demographics versus psychographics. So it used to be in the past that we try to understand different groups based on their um, basic characteristics in terms of education, age, gender, and so on and so forth. What the digital technology allows you to do now is basically to focus, uh, to focus on personalities, on values. That is, to micro-target uh, a particular users based on their preferences. There was a study, again, that was published in 2013, very interesting one, uh, which uh, claimed, based on a large sample, that um, uh, 300 likes, probably you've read that, 300 likes allows, you know, the, 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 the allows you or gives a better uh, picture about uh, uh, your next move or about your old profile better than your spouse. So the algorithm can read you better in terms of personality, in terms of your values, better than your spouse from 300 likes. So this is what, in a sense, you know, the, 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 the Cambridge Analytica tried to do uh, is to uh, understand a little bit better user and to serve and to uh, put to them certain type of message that they think resonated at the individual level uh, much better with them. 
I just want to caution here, as I mentioned at the beginning, only because you are exposed to certain message doesn't, seem, doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to react or the, the, that leads to action in a particular day. It is more likely, but you know, not, it's important not to jump uh, to conclusions that exposure means uh, behavioral change. I mean, the chain of causality is a bit more complicated. So these are the, the, the four features that I wanted to highlight uh, about the role of data, about the role of emotions, about the role of visuals, the algorithm, in order to understand, you know, for the discussion that we're going to have, how, what makes, in a sense, you know, fake news, and what makes this information work particularly effectively in the context of the digital. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Cornelio. Uh, coming back to colors, I'm sure that we all travel green here. We, we would like to convey joy, so this <laughs> is not a real uh, problem. But uh, thank you for explaining us how the uh, digital medium uh, has changed, uh, in a way, the rules of a game. So let's turn now to Jan, maybe, to, to try to, to go a bit further on these issues and then try to explain a bit more about perceptions and practices and how it has changed uh, the view we have on uh, fake news and uh, digital diplomacy. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I understand this is like Friday evening in the Netherlands, <laughs> in Europe. It's Thursday evening. So that's how I've taken this conversation uh, here. Uh, and the way I come into this conversation is that I have an interest in diplomacy. How diplomacy is evolving, how diplomacy is changing, how diplomacy is adapting to the digital age. So I'm not coming into this conversation with any specific expertise about technology, Thanks for all your kind words, but I actually believe that in this conversation, most of us are amateurs and not experts. And even the tech giants who have not thought about the social and political implications of what they have on offer for everybody, I think could be confronted with the question, well, how have you thought this through? And I think we really, I'm personally at the stage where I feel, well, we have to think about how we structure the conversations about the digital age and digital diplomacy. Because in fact, we're being surprised. We, we find one surprise after, after another. And I can remember in an earlier meeting where both Cornelia and I were, uh, we were comparing this like chasing rabbits or herding cats. Uh, uh, but indeed, following the latest developments rather than staying ahead of the game, which is, which is so difficult. It's very perceptions of, what, of digital diplomacy and the impact of digital technology on international relations have also changed very radically. I'd like to take you back in time to 2011, 12, 13, when many citizens were in the digital realm, but not so much their government. And there was really a feeling that this was empowering the powerless, that this was a force for good. Fast forward to 2016, 17, 18, I don't have to fill you in. We have a slightly different perception of the social and political impact of these new technologies. It has profoundly affected how individuals also perceive the digital realm, their sense of security, their desire for privacy, their relationship with government. So we are navigating a realm where these relationships are changing, and that's where I'm coming from in how I want to approach this. this if we are talking about international relations as indeed relations, relationships. Uh, the diplomacy goes back to the ancient Near East, mid third century before Christ, before, before the common era, wherever you come from. Uh, uh, and that is, it has adapted through the millennia to all sorts of changes. So diplomacy is going to, it's my safe bet, is going to survive this one as well. As Lord Palmerston said, uh, the, the telegram, the cable, uh, meant in his view the end of diplomacy. We know now it did not mean the end of diplomacy. What it did mean is that it gave governments a tool to control much better their own apparatus. Uh, it was a control tool for relations with, uh, with their uh, system of embassies. So we can wonder now how the digital age is affecting this relationship within a system that was never designed to confront the digital age. 
with people who are still largely digital immigrants or digital tourists, but definitely not digital natives. So we see that we are, we are navigating a new realm with organizations and individuals who are not quite prepared for this and who have a challenge in the sense that organizations change slowly and we see here have to follow increasingly society. In the past, communication was top down from government to society. To society. Now, the government have to put their ear on the ground, have to watch very closely to how their citizens, how citizens communicate to enter in that conversation in order uh, to make themselves to make themselves relevant. So how and to, I think there is a risk of too much focusing on the hard side of it, on the data side of it, on the tech side of it. And although the, the analogy is not a correct one, I hope it is effective. When I take myself back to the age in which I was born, the Cold War, I'm just thinking back of how many decades people in Europe we're talking about numbers of missiles, of warheads, of yield and range, and that what is seemed to be the essence of discussions on the on the Cold War. Then in February 1985, President Reagan and the Soviet leader Gorbachev sat together and they somehow broke the ice. It was the relationship between the countries that changed the game. So the, the excessive focus, as I said, is not enti entirely correct analogy, but the message I'm trying to drive home, we should, we should focus on relationships, on the people, on relations between government and people, between nations, not necessarily uh, just the hardware. So it's not just the tools. When we talk about digital diplomacy, which is a misnomer in the first place, there is also culinary diplomacy, panda diplomacy, sports diplomacy, public diplomacy, and have you. Uh, so one could, a linguist could perhaps say it's not a good way of, it's diplomacy. And as John Kerry said, former Secretary of State, digital diplomacy is diplomacy, period. But diplomacy in the digital age. And we see indeed that digital comes in, the digital dimension touches almost everything in diplomacy. So it's more than just using tools, uh, um, digital tools. It's what we experience as an environment which is physical and analog, which is online and offline, and we switch between the two worlds. And perhaps we could say it's a landscape in which we see that there are social and political consequences of the use of new technologies, all sorts of, of, of new technologies of young people living in a digital condition. So that's a long way from, from uh, yeah, just using a shiny uh, telephone, this object. It's no, it's really in inhabiting uh, uh, a different kind of world. And that, that world is foreign ministries were never designed to operate in that world. Embassies are confronted with empty shelves because you no longer need those spaces. Uh, 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 you no longer need that space. So you have to rethink to redesign diplomacy in a way, so in that, that sense it is very profound. Just as some other sectors in the economy have been completely redesigned because the arrival of digital, whether it's the hospitality industry, uh, uh, whether it's the taxi business, uh, um, you can think of other sectors in the economy, the media of course, uh, that have really redesigned themselves. I think foreign ministries in some sectors, one of them is delivering service to their nationals abroad, with an old-fashioned word, consular assistance, the whole system needs to be redesigned because of the impact of, of um, technology. So two things, uh, to just in my, my introductory remarks to, to close on that. Uh, one is the relationship between government and citizens. And I think that is one that as a result of technological change and new cycles that has changed a lot, and that we can indeed see that where government was having an information monopoly in the past, government is increasingly following and has to follow communication patterns in society uh, in order to, uh, to be um, effective. Um, so this is sort of a turning of, of, of the tables where also governments are using information channels that are not privileged official channels no, governments are in the social media, 
in order to reach their citizens, in order to crowdsource information from, from citizens. So that is in the history of diplomacy of thousands of years, quite a revolution, this opening up uh, to this new media realm. But this new media realm is infected by fake news. And that is where certainly I am only beginning to scratch my head uh, what, this, what, this really, what this really means. Uh, uh, so it's definitely technology has changed the, the scale, the nature, the speed, and the direction of disinformation. And perhaps what makes fake news fake news, as I see it, but I'm open to learning a lot in this conversation, is precisely indeed that it looks real. So it's in, in a sense, it's the cosmetic aspect of it. And we're confronted with a situation where now or in a very near future, it is almost impossible to distinguish authentic from non-authentic. So this is where there are senders of fake news, where there are intermediaries, uh, and also where there are the recipients of fake news. And I think in the discussion, we will have to establish how, how, to, uh, how to deal with all that. Uh, as a, just a, um, um, to see this in perspective, um, I imagine that for many people in the world, fake news is old news. Because fake news has always been there. Also in its, its, its non-technological manifestation, systematic disinformation. And sometimes that systematic this information comes from the same people who control information. It can come from the government. Uh, so we have, so in, in, in many countries, a situation where people have, been, have grown up by reading between the lines, have grown up by not trusting the news, just as I have grown up by the idea that you switch on the television at 8 o'clock in the evening, because that's where we listen and see the news. And the news tells us the truth about what's going on in the world. So we're adapting to a whole, wholly new uh, situation. Thank you. There, there, there is a, a, we have different perceptions. We have uh, the, tech, the technology here to help us uh, understand better the evolution of fake news. And, and you are both encapsulating the, the, the evolutions and the changes that affect directly fake news. What is interesting here for me, because when we hear fa fake news, we hear not only fake news, we hear fake history, we hear fake science, we hear fake Americans, we hear uh, fake peacemakers. If you, if you look at the placards that the women in Paris during the World War I commemoration last week uh, held in their hands, so we have a lot of fake things. Uh, around there. So what, what strikes me is that the definition of fake news is not very certain. It's not very uh, uh, sure. So what would you think would be a, a good definition of fake news? Because recently the UK government, I was reading something yesterday, that the UK government announced that the phrase will no longer appear on policy documents and on any political papers. So the word fake news is banned from any political uh, papers or any policy document that the government is issuing right now. So this brings me to uh, the idea of what exactly you, you can understand. Is there a clear view of what the spectrum of fake news would be exactly today? What, what we call fake news? Maybe the US president has a, an idea of the fake news. Maybe the UK prime minister has another idea. Maybe the French president, Macron, also has a different idea of fake news. So that's, what would you be your take on this? I think, yeah, the concept um, or the, the, the label fake news is very catchy, especially for the media. And also has political implications. Some people, you know, some politicians use it deliberately in order to preempt criticism. Um, this is why, you know, for instance, partly in the academic debate, but also in some policy papers in UK and not only, the term has been uh, replaced with disinformation or misinformation. The difference between the two is about intention. Disinformation, when you present something that you know is not true, it cannot be supported by facts, that the earth is flat, for instance, right? The earth is flat and you present that deliberately and you put it there. 
misinformation when you don't know about this, and it happens with citizens when they pass on information to their friends and, uh, and networks of users without knowing whether that's genuine or not. What I found interesting, and there was a, a study done by uh, a MIT team this year, it was published in, in Nature, I think, or Science, it says that you know, actually citizens are a big player in the dissemination. So we focus on states, we try to pursue certain strategic objectives in Europe and elsewhere, but the, the, those who are actually conveying or transmitting this news, um, to a large extent, are, are citizens. And the question is why? And this study uh, actually identified why sometimes we know that information is false and we continue to pass on as citizens, as digital users, is the degree of novelty in the news that seems to, uh, to make or drive certain users to basically pass on. So why I think is this important? Because certain, it, it uh, again blurs the distinction that I just made, right? Between disinformation and misinformation. To what extent that distinction still holds the moment that actually citizens, regardless of the fact that they might know this is not true, they pass on. But it's one thing when you think about fake news as a concept, as a source, as a process of dissemination, but also about the implications, because this is where you know, the concern is mainly, uh, do they have impact? Uh, do they, we, we started to get worried after the US elections, after Brexit, after what's going on, you know, the populist movements in, in, in Europe. And what we learned from that, and this is what I'm trying to, to drive, is that initially, before 2006, we couldn't care less about fake news. We couldn't care less about disinformation. We knew, I mean, internet is not something new. Web has existed, you know, for, for 30 years. Uh, crazies, people who basically have all kinds of opinions, have been in the online, you know, for ages. What changed with 2006, 16, uh, with Brexit and US election, is that the online conversation has moved offline. Mm -hmm. It can, so this kind of situation has offline political ramifications. This is why, you know, in many situations, people started to take notice. Look, uh, this is no longer encapsulated or stays isolated, contained online. It spills over offline. Can we do something about this? Is there, you know, a, an instrument to, to engage? So um, I think why can, Effort is continues to be uh, uh, focused on, on, on the question of, of what exactly, how much deception, who is involved into that. I think the debate, to a certain extent, has moved more pragmatically, uh, pragmatically to the to the uh, point of what to do about it, how to make sure that this this filter between online and offline is reinforced to a certain extent, and uh, yeah, maybe. Fake n yes, yes, fake news. I was asked by my, one of my employers, the Klingendal Institute of International Relations, which is a think tank, to write a Klingendal alert, which is sort of a policy brief, uh, short policy alert about fake news. Now, unlike academics who take their time to read and to reflect, think tankers go into the pressure cooker and they have to do that in uh, just mm. a, a couple of days. And whilst I was thinking about this issue, it, I got increasingly also annoyed by the, hmm. the, the term fake news to the extent that even queuing in the supermarket, I heard people around me talking about fake news. So the, the, the term has become virtually meaningless uh, by indeed by using it for so many different things like the news reported by organizations, news organizations disliked by the US president, so you, you just brandish them oh. as, as fake news organization. Now, when you reach that point, uh, the, ditch, the, the situation, the, the discussion becomes very difficult. Now, what's interesting, what was interesting and is interesting in, in my perception in this discussion of fake news is that there was an immediate triggering, uh, what was triggered by governments and also in the, Europe, the, the EU, the uh, European External Action Service, was the idea, well, it was when you want to fight fake news, you have to expose the makers of fake news. And this created a sort of a Cold War-like dynamic where 
Western governments and organizations were saying in the direction of Russia, you are producing fake news, which is, was of course uh, denied on the other side. So we saw old Cold War reflexes and dynamics coming back in, in this discussion. Uh, which I think is was not very is, was not very productive. And another thing uh, uh, that struck me and that strikes me in the discussion about fake news is indeed, uh, as Cornelia also alluded to, you have to look at the receiver, because the receiver is a producer, is a reproducer. Mm -hmm. Those who are the real makers of fake news are perhaps not those who make the original news item, but those who love, who like who share, who reproduce, who make this go viral immediately. So that is in fact where you have to start fighting fake news, to my yeah. perception. Fighting fake news, learning what fake news is and, and, and how to, to deal with it. We perhaps have to see it that individuals, as we all know, have become journalists. Individuals have become producers of news. So my question is for now, so perhaps then certain professional standards that journalists have to abide to also apply to citizens. We're in an era where there are new forms of news production, new forms of writing, new forms of literacy, meta-literacy. The younger generations, they have to deal with news out there on the understanding that the news may be real or not real. They are exposed to systematic disinformation and information which is closer to, to their ideas. So perhaps with new forms of writing, new forms of new production or news production, we also have to think of our own society as a society that needs new forms of literacy, where almost as a rule, you have to take in opposing opinions in this process of opinion formation where the algorithms and so many other reasons, and even in a pre-digital age, we were in echo chambers. Of course, the echo chambers is a fashionable mm -hmm. word, uh, uh, the, the filter bubbles, but they've always been yeah. there. The Catholic Church is an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, the Western world is an echo chamber. Uh, my, own so, my own country uh, uh, as a pillarized society, uh, which had its, 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 its own echo chamber. So some of these phenomena that have been given hip words have always ex existed, and but we have to perhaps rethink about how to make our societies resilient for a phenomenon that will not go away. Yeah, we are at the stage of uh, not only understanding the phenomenon, but in trying to co to combat this this very phenomenon. But before coming back to strategies, you you could uh, imagine for counter this uh, phenomenon of fake news. Uh, what are exactly the strategies and the tools? I, I will take an example here to try to illustrate a bit more. In, uh, it has been reported that in Burma, uh, you have a population of 50 million people. Uh, of them, you have 30 million people that are using, uh, that are monthly users on Facebook. And uh, Facebook has a, a free service wh whose name is Free Basics that offers free internet to uh, a few uh, developing countries and especially in Burma. So in this uh, uh, offering, at the same time, uh, uh, Facebook is limiting uh, the information available to users. And recently, I think it is this year, the uh, United Nations uh, and, and Facebook is the only uh, possibility of information online in, in Burma. And recently, the United Nations, I think since 2018, has named uh, Facebook through the uh, dissemination of fake uh, accounts, uh, mainly as being responsible for the hate speech against the Rohingya Muslim population there. So it, it creates a lot of controversies, a lot of problems, because we have now a tool whose name is Facebook, which is offering through its basic free service something that uh, could uh, undermine uh, international aid and also undermine any peace agreement that could come from that. So the, the question basically would be, uh, how, uh, what are the, the short-term and long-term uh, impacts of such uh, what we call online force hoods also? Absolutely. But I think this is a, the key question because if you ask the government, they want short-term effective responses. Mm -hmm. 
They don't want to hear that you know, you're going to solve the problem in 10 years or 20 mm. years. Nobody wants to hear that. So there have been some attempts. I just to, want to give a, 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 an example, if I, if I may, with some tools that uh, am I looking rightly here. Uh, what is it? Oops. I don't see the mouse. Sorry. Uh, Still existing the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> is it here? Yeah. Um, right. Uh, I think the mouse has disappeared. <coughs> oh, okay. Um, so, if I go here. So this is a, a tool that was developed by the University of Northern Carolina. Um, and um, it might be interesting to take a look at how um, it's called, uh, uh, very uh, rightly so, hoaxy. Um, hoaxy, right, exactly. I mean, very uh, tailored to, to the problem. All right. So, for instance, I mean, we can go here and type UAE and then try to find out what kind of stories um, we find about UAE. Um, there is one article which is visualized, but then you can find, you know, more. Yeah. Oops. Oh, yeah, you're talking, about, yeah, by myself, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. All right. So this is a tool that you, um, let me go back here, uh, allows you, mm. Like Google, you know, put a keyword and try to find what kind of stories are being circulated about UAE and to what extent these are uh, real or not, you know, genuine or not. So you can see here, for instance, you know, all kind of. It goes back a little bit to what I said before. There are all of emotions here. The very the titles that you can see here are very much, you know, framed in a way that wants to provoke, wants to take a reaction. For instance, this one it's about U.S. involvement in torture and detention center. What is interesting about this, it allows you to see in real time who is doing that. This is, you know, in a sense, you can uh, uh, check. Um, and uh, it produces a map, which what is interesting about it, it looks both at what is considered to be human users, disseminators of fake news, but also the bots, which serve basically to disseminate or to amplify the message. How is this useful? It is useful because then you can see who is actually more involved. Vanessa Billy, apparently, it's one promoter of this kind of messages, and it's not necessarily a bot. Um, the, 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 the type of nodes in the network then, uh, to a certain extent, allows exactly this kind of short-term solution. Governments lo love this because then you can isolate the nodes, you can disrupt the, the network, you can stop the flow of fake news to a certain extent. But it's also, you have to consider this, this is also a band-aid. It's a band-aid in the sense that why these messages sometimes resonate with the people, aside from the elements that I mentioned before, is that there are some deep cleavages in the society, right? Whether we speak about racism, or you speak about poverty, whether we speak these things that are actually amplified with this kind of messages. So in short term, you may be able to identify who is involved in this kind of business and to a certain extent to isolate the notes. There is a lot of pressure, for instance, in Germany, they passed the legislation exactly to do these kind of things, to identify putting the burden on Facebook. So if a story like this emerges, you, Facebook, have 24 hours to uh, kill it, to remove it. Otherwise, you'll face a penalty of 50 million euros. So that type of thinking goes into the short term how to map, how to isolate those who are actually involved in fake news. Uh, but the longer term is, is more complicated. Uh, longer term because uh, cleavage in the society cannot be healed in, in a week or a year. There was another study that was produced for Europe saying, OK, when you look at the European countries, which one are more resilient? Resilient is the key word nowadays in this business. Which country are more resilient to this kind of disinformation? And they identify three factors. So one was, uh, interestingly, uh, level of education. 
And that always seems to go. The higher the level of education, the more allegedly immune you are to fake news. Why? Because university gives you training for thinking critically. That's the argument. Uh, uh, and then you are, be able to, to are better able to, uh, to distinguish between stories that sounds you know, uh, totally off. Um, and that might be the case. Um, uh, the second factor, interestingly enough, it was about uh, a strong media, mass media system. And that makes sometimes the countries that are more on the autocratic side problematic because citizens are looking for alternative sources of information. When you don't have credible media, and some of the European countries don't have that, you know, especially in Eastern Europe, then you know, it, it, it creates a problem. But the third factor, I found it the most interesting one. And the, first act, uh, the third factor that creates this kind of immunity against this information for fake news, it's about the level of trust of citizens, not only in government, which is now a big problem, but also in the other citizens, in their fellow citizens what is called social capital. To what extent this kind of, you know, do you leave your car open, I don't know, type of thing, uh, uh, without fearing that, you know, something will may happen. So trust in the fellow citizens. Well, all these three factors that I mentioned, you don't build them overnight, right? The education system, the media system, trust in the society, right? These are long-term uh, projects. Uh, and the Scandinavians, apparently, and, and, and Netherlands, uh, so, uh, seems to be very resilient. So uh, I, the, the introductory remark that you mentioned, look, this is not something new to, to cool off a little bit. That was a, a reflection, I think, you know, of, the, of the resilience of the, of the Dutch society. <laughs> so there is something about you know, the long-term, uh, uh, if you call, you know, uh, impact of, of how the society should prepare for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, one of the biggest threats, I think, is uh, it's uh, something that is connects also with uh, free speech. Because when we, 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 we speak about uh, fake news and other similar uh, disinformation uh, stuff, we, we only face the freedom of speech. So how can you reconcile the freedom of speech any society needs with the uh, amount of uh, extraordinary amount of fake news we are facing today and how to discriminate and how to be able to, to know exactly what, what, what we need in terms of free speech or fake news. Yes, so apparently we need more regulation. Yeah. Uh, the, the tech giants have to be tamed. There is increasing pressure on, on the, the, the tech giants to uh, stop the dissemination of non-reliable, offensive, offensive mm -hmm. uh, information. Um, apart from free speech, I think it's also we have to think here what's, and uh, thinking out loud, uh, um, is we have a collision between different logics, corporate logic, and, and the logic in the world um, of, of diplomacy. Uh, in diplomacy, as somebody recently told me, in more than 5,000 years, there is not something like a free lunch. Mm -hmm. I think in the corporate world, there is not something like a free product. And how have we assumed for a long time that these wonderful products, the communication products by the tech giants uh, that were offered to us, were in fact facilitating communication, whilst of course, they were data, uh, data that are that are proprietary data that can be sold. Uh, uh, that uh, the profit is, of course, the ultimate purpose of any any company, mm -hmm. as we have also heard in the conference uh, at the Emirates Diplomatic um, uh, Academy today. So perhaps on the the side of governments and those in diplomacy, there has been, to a degree, uh, people have been slightly naive about how we can use the new communication channels. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, not being aware sufficiently of this commercial, uh, commercial uh, side of it. Apart from the fact that there is another dimension that when you use new channels of information, it takes a long time for bureaucracies to find your way and ease in using those avenues of, of information. I remember one conversation with a director of a public diplomacy department of a foreign ministry who was so happy that all his ambassadors are now on Facebook. So I was wondering that there are so many people who no longer think Facebook is a place to be, who are migrating in other ways. So I tried to picture how much effort it would take for that same foreign ministry to get all the ambassadors on the <laughs> channels that young people 
are using. So we have these these different different layers uh, of of this problem that uh, that makes it very very complex. And I'd like to think also about this in terms of of diplomacy. Diplomats now fear when we look at just the communication side of things at the the weaponization, weaponization. of communication. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that this is really a, a, a space where you can no longer be very sure of where information is coming from and, and indeed that polluted information is, is, is also infiltrating uh, your communication channels. Now, that is one side of looking at digital communication and diplomacy. I think another side that I'd just like to mention briefly is how these technologies can also help for very good purposes. And we see that in development cooperation, mm -hmm. and we see it in humanitarian <laughs> crisis, and we see it, for instance, in the business of assisting nationals abroad. And, and well, perhaps whether or not you want to go into that conversation, yes. but it's, it is, I think it is an important dimension uh, of digitization that these new tools, these new technologies can be used to deliver better products, to deliver uh, better policies, to help with development, to help in humanitarian crisis. So that takes us a bit away from, from, from fake the news, news to the, the, good, the good effects to which you can use these kind of uh, technologies. Uh, coming back a bit to about the strategies to, to try to combat the, uh, these type of fake news, what, what, what kind of mechanism could you think of to, to spot fake news? A lot of things have been tried, I guess, but what type of mechanism would be more effective uh, what type of, uh, I know algorithms can be used both ways. Uh, I know that a uh, number of efforts have tried to set up a sort of code of principles to try to, or some fact-checking mechanisms that would be internationalized. So what's, what really would work? And this is very interesting, I think, to know. I mean, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, the fact-checking websites, you know, have, mm -hmm. have you started to develop quite quite significantly um, uh, and uh, they, there seems to be an effort done by some of the Facebook and other companies basically to integrate or to co coordinate their activity with these fact-checking websites. As I mentioned before, this matters, it's important, but it's not the end of the story because citizens still disseminate stuff which they know is false. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about the novelty in the message, the, the sensationalist aspect that they like to share, apparently, with, with this. And I think uh, um, uh, the, the second aspect, which has been, especially in Europe, the type of effort, is what is called media literacy. Mm -hmm. That is that <clears throat> you have to, to educate journalists, you have to educate uh, opinion leaders, you have to educate influencers about how to read, how to do, uh, uh, how to spot this kind of, of stories. Mm -hmm. It's tricky business, and uh, Jan knows uh, that uh, better because there have been some Dutch newspapers involved in, uh, on, a, on a negative side. Um, uh, in the, the sense that, uh, for instance, the European Action Service has a, a disinformation unit trying to spot fake news, and what they do, do this kind of thing, and, and they try to see where the fake news is coming from. And they, create a they created a blacklist. And on the blacklist, they <laughs> included three Dutch newspapers who were actually quite mainstream. Mm. And then there was a reaction, of course, you know, from the Dutch uh, parliament saying, you know, shut down this, this unit because it violates freedom of speech and so on. Um, so there was a little bit of, of, mm. of trouble there. Uh, and then, then they have to, you know, uh, there is a political issue there to, 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 uh, to, to take notice. Um, but one part is, where is it coming from? Who are the producers? To what extent? Uh, and the line sometimes is not very clear. To what extent this is fake news or, you know, it's something that, you know, more exaggerated political claim that to a certain extent is protected by, by uh, freedom of speech. Um, uh, on, on, on other countries that are more exposed to this kind of problem, I'm referring to the Baltic states, they've been more vigorous in building resistance and resilience against this kind of, of activities. Um, and it's, again, you know, uh, uh, an interesting issue because uh, we talk about fake news, but it's already two or three years old in terms of the digital impact. And uh, why is that important? Because we, as humans, uh, learn and adapt. Learn and adapt. This is what we are good at. Right. We learned about trolling in 2014. Trolling is, is still there, but 
there are tools to, to handle uh, uh, trolling. Uh, with fake news, I think we, we, we are moving into a stage in which this media literacy, identifying stories that are completely out of, of uh, uh, and you know, uh, alerting others about this, it's, uh, it's a slow process, but I think uh, we, we uh, slowly adapt. Looking into the future, situation is not very uh, rosy, uh, if we can say. I mean, we've probably mm -hmm. seen the, the situation of deep fakes. Deep fakes is when yeah, I talk, but actually, you know, on a, on a screen, but it's not actually not me. There was a famous f deep fake with Obama, you know, criticizing President wow. Trump, but that was a demo to show how these deep fakes could, uh, could work. So basically, it looks like Obama, uh, sounds like Obama, but it's not Obama. Right? I mean, the mm -hmm. message was totally uh, off. And that it makes, why is that important? The technology comes from Hollywood. It's, it's important to make mm. movies, right? I mean, it's, it's not something malefic uh, about it. But it uh, can be used as any technology in a, in a dual sense. And that make, given the fact of the speed and the information, it makes more difficult uh, sometimes, you know, especially in time of crisis, imagine a situation of international crisis mm -hmm. when the president, unless the president or the head of state, says something that it's totally yeah. different. Okay. Could uh, I comment yeah. on this one briefly? Yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that what we also see in a very broad sense is how we have moved from naive optimism about what these new technologies afford, how they help us, how they make us happy, uh, how they empower the powerless. The pendulum has swung very much to the other side. So I think, don't think the future is bright, but I don't want to be completely gloomy about this uh, um, either. On your question, uh, um, I don't feel entirely competent uh, to comment on how exactly you have to trace and fight fake news because what's also coming in is quite a lot of technical mm -hmm. expertise uh, uh, by um, digital media experts uh, who know how to, how to handle this. One group is the Digital Methods Initiative in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. They work with people from, from all over the globe and what they're doing, they're using, using case studies and, and look at case studies to trace, in fact, how news is traveling, because you have to, to, to retrace that in order. You have to understand it uh, before fighting it. You have to understand how these, what the pattern, the, the flows of these, these conversations are. So I'd just like to, 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 to flag, flag that point. Recently, last week or earlier this week, there was an, an, an item on the, the BBC News app, as far as you read the BBC News app, uh, where this was exactly done in African countries. So how news travels? Is, is what you have to understand and where case studies can give you these kinds of specific insights. Working with fact checkers, uh, I, I uh, um, alluded before to the sort of Cold War dynamics that you can, can get. Some of the fact checkers that were hired by the European Union and that uh, told Dutch papers and other newspapers that they were using fake news who is actually checking the, che the fact checkers? So the fact checkers appear to be a very small group of uh, people who were ideologically extremely hostile towards Russia, associated with a small think tank in the Czech Republic called the European Values Think Tank. So the whole operation got a very dodgy sort of uh, gloss over it, uh, 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 which, which shows you that doing these kinds of things uh, ex exposes you to, well, becoming politically embroiled. Uh, people are doing this often for certain reasons. And, and, and yeah, and there is certainly a role for mainstream media also to try to fight against fake news because it's media against media at the end, and uh, it's very difficult to understand how the real mainstream media can fight against. But I think it's time now to, to give uh, the floor to the to the audience for uh, for uh, questions on on this uh, comments very also session certainly or comments. Yeah, we, I, I think we have one first question here in front of me. Yeah, please. Yeah, two questions for one person. That's that's fine, I guess. <laughs> but in, in we will take in sequence. Yeah. Yeah, 
And sure. the second question? Thank you. On the first point, perhaps uh, Cornelio can also fill me in and add, add his knowledge to this. The external action service at a, at a certain point um, decided that next to NATO, uh, they had to go into the business of uh, fighting uh, uh, foreign disinformation. But what and a million euros was invested as a sort of a first gesture in, in, in tracing this information. Uh, but the problem was, if I, that's your, your question, the problem was that they were relying very much on volunteers uh, 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 to help them with this, or people who were, were uh, delivering uh, paid services. And, and indeed, the tracing the news to where it originated uh, exposed then the, the, the in, in the, uh, many cases the Russian origin of certain of certain news items. So that's why this kind of exposure was then uh, where news was filtered into news streams uh, was singled out uh, by by showing its its original source, uh, and that's how. Well, of course, you get a sort of a tit for tit for tat situation uh, between the uh, the West, uh, the West, and, and the East, and this is where the European External Action Service uh, got into a game, uh, which is what many people saw as what not the European External Action Service is really for uh, in the the field of what's not called public diplomacy, but strategic uh, strategic communication and exposing strategic miscommunication by the other side. Well, well, yes, indeed. I mean, the, the unit was set up in 2015 by the European Action Service. It's called the EU uh, Disinformation Unit. I mean, if you Google you, And they produce this newsletter every week in which they collect information from all over Europe, especially, but not only in English or French, or it's, you know, the local languages, and they have a, a big network. Some of them are affiliated with the European value, others are other type of volunteers. And they produce this, and I think it has, a, it serves, I mean, I. I it serves a positive uh, purpose to a certain extent because it provides this kind of environment for media literacy. This is why it was set up to understand what is going on. Uh, and they started to see that you know, all kind of crazy stories are being circulated in the European information environment. Uh, that, uh, and they, uh, they try to understand what is going on. Um, uh, the latest one, uh, the latest concern was, for instance, with the, the Catalan referendum uh, in Spain, uh, when the, the Spaniards were taken by surprise. They said, what is going on here? And uh, there was a recent study done on that as well. The technique is not particularly, I mean, attributed to Russia, but it's not particularly surprising. I mean, it's, it's, if you think about it, the, the way in which this information, what they discover is that if you throw a lot of garbage out there, some of it will stick. It's a statistical issue. So the more bad stories and crazy stories you throw out there, so what kind of stories? So for instance, in Spain, it was this uh, separatist movement. That's the wound. Make it bigger, right? In Germany, the refugee crisis. Make mm -hmm. it bigger. Um, in uh, Baltic states uh, and so on, you know, they have an issue, for instance, with a lot of people migrated to Western Europe, uh, doctors, uh, intellectuals, better salaries. Make that bigger. In Finland, I have a study with a student I'm doing right now, uh, created because it's one of the most resilient Finland countries. There was a story with uh, kids uh, being taken by the government, crazy story. But the, because whatever, domestic violence issues, and they blew it out, uh, you know, so that, mm. again, so you identify small crisis and you make that bigger. So what the European Action Service tried to collect this kind of stories, the mandate they have is very limited in the sense they don't have the mandate to react. Okay, I found the story, what am I going to do now? Go into strategic communication, try to undermine the story, put another, another, they don't have the legal mandate from the European Parliament on that. It's just collect the information, put it, you know, inform the people what is going on. So this is what, uh, what is happening. On the second issue with the three candle lights, that's an interesting one. It was published uh, by one of the founders of Cambridge Analytica in Cambridge. 
uh, in 2013, very interesting studies, uh, where they collected information and they tried, you know, using statistics and different methods to understand by looking at you and finding 300 likes, what do I learn about you? I learn likes on Facebook that you put. So you, you, you get a lot of, of things from your friends, from your acquaintances, mm -hmm. and we do that. We share, we like, we put an emoticon. Yeah. So when I look and I collect 300 or 500 likes, what do I learn about? I learn about, you know, you like this or you don't like that. So then I get a, what I call psychographic. It's not about gender education stuff, that's yesterday news. It's more about your political, uh, your uh, personality profile. And with 300 likes, I can get as accurate as your spouse in understanding you. And they went down to 75 likes uh, uh, being as able to understand you as a co-worker. So from a co-worker to the spouse, depending on the number of likes. Now, if you understand that, you can play the game and you like on different things just to confuse the algorithm, right? I mean, but uh, um, it's more difficult to do that because, as you know, Cambridge Analytica managed to, um, to scrap this data, to collect this data by using an app, a personality profile the app. And they collected, I don't know, uh, it was a big number. But uh, after the, the scandal um, was, was made public, uh, Facebook closed the door. So now it's more difficult to collect that data unless someone hacks Facebook as it happened, you know, a month ago, know. and then collect the data. So, it, but uh, that's, that's uh, the psychographic. Again, this is not something that Facebook or Twitter or other companies had in mind. The point for them was to keep people online. And in order to understand, uh, to keep you online, you have to understand you. What do you like? What kind of news you like? Uh, what kind of things? Uh, so then the ads come. Uh, based on the type of preferences. So when I do these kind of trips abroad, they start to send me uh, advertising about British Airways, you know, <coughs> that type of thing. You know, so, uh, so on the, on maybe the, you like British Airways. Very small <laughs> point on, on the, 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 the Twitter handle and the exposure of fake news by the European External Action Service. It certainly raises with me the question, it raises with me the question, who is actually following that Twitter handle? So is it another echo chamber? Is it pray, pray, praying to the converted? Uh, uh, um, um, so I think that is, there is this limited, it's very limited here, uh, uh, what you can achieve with that. The sort of fake news is very strategic, <laughs> that, uh, uh, and sometimes it's completely random, like uh, the Lithuanian prime minister is a KDB agent, or incest has become a norm in Europe. Uh, you, it's becoming too wild to, to imagine uh, what's, what's out there. Thank you. Any other? Yes, please. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, talk. Um, I was wondering, with this kind of analytics, there we see, hopefully, it's not a real name, Vanessa Bealy. Um, how would you regard it from a legislative perspective if that person is singled out as being a fire starter and that's being picked up and it got serious consequences for certain groups or companies or governments that legislation might say, we're going to go after this lady and we're going to impose a fine or any other kind of punishment. How would you look at that? Because if you can single out a person who's starting that fake news or alternative news, um, would you suggest that you have to go into the legislative part, or would you say, well, that we need to shy away from that before you know you can start to prosecute people who just might have misread something and tweeted, retweeted it, and then all of a sudden you get a fine? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, a, yeah. that's a big issue, and it touches on issues of freedom of expression and, and political freedom. I mean, it, it varies from country to country. In the US, I mean, the conditions for are more liberal. You don't, First Amendment, you don't do certain things like this, right? Uh, in Germany, if there is a particular, depends on what she, that person tweets. If there is certain uh, topics that she touches upon, uh, or, uh, then, you know, then she can prosecute it, whether you talk about you know, the Holocaust or hate speech, these kind of things, which are already there is legislation against that. Um, otherwise, what we've seen in, uh, is that actually the citizens start to report, I mean, the abuse, and Facebook has to look at, uh, at it. 
Um, so I think it, it varies uh, from, from country to country, uh, country, to country. Um, what uh, for some um, uh, governments, where, where these things becomes interesting is that um, sometimes it's not, um, it doesn't go that the way of prosecution. Uh, it's just, you know, trying to disrupt the network themselves um, using other digital means. So it's, this is where we go into the area of strategic communication and, and other aspects. But yeah, uh, it, it's, it's, it's becoming, uh, um, um, uh, depending on the situation, quite, quite, a, uh, quite a sensitive issue. Um, and it touches on, on issues, as I said, and what, what extent is political opinions, maybe it's exaggerated or, yeah. Jan, you may comment. Yes, just, yeah. just a, a small point um, to make here, which is not related to your, your question, but I think it's we have to get this also to the level of the conduct of international relations by foreign ministries who are not ready for this. Because what I understand, there is an, there's quite a dissonance of the discourse between the experts, the discourse between the people with a sophisticated technical understanding also of what this is all about and the people on the working floor of government, uh, of uh, foreign ministries who are not nearly close to being digitally literate. And I think that is, that is a, a huge challenge. So you see, if you look at the, the, the work processes in foreign ministries and the structures of foreign ministries, it's like t conversations have to start between communities that were not aware of one another, senior management and the people touching the buttons, the, the, the technical people. Mm -hmm. So we ha you really talk about sort of, of recreating uh, uh, workflows within organizations to deal with these kinds of issues. Typically, what we've seen in Europe is that, uh, as an example, as the environment that I know is best, where a number of governments have been involved in modernizing their diplomacy. The, the Dutch called it the modernization of diplomacy. Precisely this aspect was completely neglected. Mm -hmm. I suspect one reason it was not a priority after the financial crisis. There were other drivers of these innovation and modernization uh, 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 procedures. Another one, because it was not nearly on the radar of senior management in foreign ministries. I've talked to and worked on jobs for a number of foreign ministries, commissioned research, and sometimes I asked for, if I want to talk about these issues, whom should I talk to? Now we see that at a strategic level, discussions start within government and in foreign ministries about these issues. But that has been absent for a long time. So we have to think to, to put our feet on the ground again and say, okay, there is an expert understanding of these issues, but that is not the reality of day-to-day -day operations in, in, in government. I don't know whether you have a different impression of that. No, I think it also puts a lot of pressure on the big tech companies to take measures. You know, uh, it's a problem of reputation for them. Facebook, it's, I think, the, it's still going well financially, but I think if, if this kind of uh, perception starts to build up that this is a toxic environment, they're going to lose a lot of, so there is pressure on them basically to deal with it. Um, the same, I think, Twitter, actually, they kicked off one of the uh, promoters of this kind of conspiracy, uh, Adrian Jones, I think, it, from Infowars. Uh, it was a big uh, site promoting all kind of, and they decided enough is enough, and that's it. Uh, so it puts uh, a lot of, without the government itself, but because the commercial interest, look, if we allow these kind of things, the more positive aspect of us. It also raises the issue that I think is going to become more important in the future, Trust in technology, as Jan mentioned, you know, we were quite optimistic and we love technology, gadgets, I'm one of them, I'm a technophile. But at the same time, uh, this kind of elements, it uh, seems to, to, to take a toll and uh, it raises the issue of what, what makes technology to be trustful, to be, to be able for us you know, to trust it again. Uh, and I think there is a lot of pressure on these big tech companies to take measures to clean up some of the, the negative implications, which is not an easy task. Um, yeah. Yeah, not an easy task, especially because uh, disinformation also uh, operations uh, were very good during uh, uh, military time. So when, when it comes to peacetime, we have to do something also in 
comparison uh, to that. Uh, just to give you an example why it's not an easy uh, task, uh, Facebook, because of the, the sheer amount of, of stories that are fake or you know, the, the data that they present at the beginning, what they think is that we have to employ artificial intelligence. We have mm -hmm. to employ algorithms that back. actually clean up. But how to clean up is not about removing content after the fact, because the, 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 the cat is out of the bag. It's already disseminated. It's already shaped views, opinions. So what they want to do with artificial, the moment you type, if you type it's about this kind of thing, you are not allowed to post it. But then, what remains of free speech? And, you know, so there are big ethical questions that you have yeah. to, to which, uh, which come see. back also to the idea of what is fake news. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Can I intervene for one second, just on that last remark? Because what would be your main strategy advice? Actually, how to deal with that kind of fake news? Me as a no, just. Uh, uh. Uh, what kind of strategies are there available? Do you think are most working very well? If there are, because we're dealing with fake news for sure. But how can we deal that best way? This is what I, I mentioned. I, I did a study. On, I hope to publish next year on Finland yeah. because Finland, for some reason, they managed. It's it's considered, and I think uh, there was a story also at a TV uh, North American station. I think CBS, ABC, one of them. How did they manage to uh, to react to this? So it's one thing to think about the technical button. You know, to find something that will kill it, the silver bullet, bullet in short term. The films have taken a different perspective. They say, well, you know, the way in which we build resilience against these stories, because, you know, they've been through the Cold War. I mean, as Jan mentioned, you know, this is not something that came out. It's is to work together the different institutions. Uh, so when there was the story about the, the kids that are kids, taken by the government, immediately there is a reaction at different <coughs> levels uh, in which the information is being discussed. Uh, communities are involved. Maybe it works. There are five million Finns. You know, it's a small country, you know, easily to manage, right, probably. Uh, uh, but uh, seems to be a, a good case of, of, of uh, uh, in which you bring this cooperation, not only from the government, but working with civil society. And it's, it's a more uh, complex operation. Uh, uh, th which creates filters. Uh, when you see a story like this, uh, say, well, you know, I don't know. Uh, in the UK, uh, there's been a different strategy, which is done by the government um, um, with, the, with the, the Russian disinformation. So, um, and they've been, I think, it's quite resilient to, from this point of view. The, when, when you communicate, you, what counts, it's the messenger and the message. So they went after the messenger with strategic communication. Meaning what? Meaning that what come, whatever comes from a Russian source, don't believe it. Even if they tell the truth, don't believe it. Mm -hmm. So how they managed to do this after the Skripal case is that they collected all the stories that the Russian embassy and other sources put together about who was behind the poisoning. I don't know, probably you're familiar mm -hmm. with the poisoning mm -hmm. scene. Mm -hmm. And the story circulated by the Russian. It was the French. It was the Ukrainians, it was the CIA, mm -hmm. it was uh, the UK itself, it was the Dutch. So there were 24 different stories. So they put them together, infographs, and they started a campaign about that. Look, can you believe this? Whatever comes, which, you know, everyone is guilty for that except for. So there was a strategy to then measuring impact. It's a different story, you know, but uh, um, it's a, a, a one aspect, I mean, just to give an example, a specific example, one is more enduring. I mean, the Finns, UK, taking a more focused approach occasionally. There's, there's always a sense of, if, very briefly, if I may, yeah, yeah, sure. there, there's always a sure. sense that the security community likes to absorb these kinds of discussions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah. And so we work with enemy images, with how information can be manipulated. And what disappears, and I'll stop there, but elaborate later if you like, uh, what disappears slightly is how very positive use can be made of the same technologies. And I'd less just like to emphasize that, and as a few very quick examples, the debate about sustainable development goals. Uh, these new technologies and social media can, can be used to, to reach much greater audiences. Uh, in humanitarian crisis, we see that 
uh, international non-governmental organizations like the International Committee of the Red Cross, who are light years ahead of many governments in terms of digital strategy, mm -hmm. are using these same kinds of technologies and social media channels to help people uh, in dire situations. So that is, that is another side. I think we have to remain very positive and not go into the weekend too gloomy uh, uh, to, to emphasize that there are multiple ways of using this, these, the same social media in very positive ways and for, for good purposes. Maybe here we have time for la the last question, maybe, okay. in, this, in this panel. So, Thank you. Um, and the different studies around the fake news, is there any ranking of these fake news? Um, in terms of impact of the consequences, uh, how dangerous is it, or it's just a simple, or without any big impact on the society? Mm -hmm. If so, what mm. is the ranking of the fake news in the diplomacy or the government? Because I would imagine that is probably seriously to be taken. Well, That's a good question. Well, yeah. What we have studied from 1970s on the role of media in general, um, is that when people are presenting certain news, even if they are genuine, they don't necessarily vote that way. What, what counts, it doesn't influence necessarily the behavior in such very specific way. So what, how news affect people politically is they make them think about what to vote. So this is why the fake news is particularly important in terms of timing. If it's before the elections, before the referendum, before this kind of thing, you need to pay clear attention because the fake news can set the agenda, can get people. If you talk about refugees for three months, if you let the agenda be set on that, people are going to think about that and they're going to vote accordingly. It's not that the, the, the fake news are going to tell them you know, to vote for that part or that party, but they give them the issue that makes them think and the other sides to react to it. You know, the other side, I mean, the other actors to react to it. So what is important about fake news is not in terms of uh, the magnitude, is the timing. When do they happen? If it's before election, pay attention. I don't think we, we've got to that stage uh, to predict what kind of mm -hmm. fake news, unless, as I mentioned, you know the social cleavages in your society. In Spain, there is a separatist movement, everybody knows, so that's a wound. So you should expect. I was talking, I don't know, uh, there was a different conference with someone from the um, uh, World uh, Trade, uh, not the World Trade Organization, the Davos Forum. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, uh, it was an interesting presentation. So unlike all of you, um, various members from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I know when I'm going to hit, be hit by fake news. In January, before the Davos, <laughs> before the Davos conference. And uh, 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 he, they have like, they said, well, I have the luxury to prepare for that. Nine months I can prepare and can, uh, and can anticipate based on, on the past where these kind of stories are going to come and hit me. Uh, from the right and from the left, more ideological because of the profile of Davos. But in many other cases, you don't. And you don't have the resources to, to fight on a constant basis this. Uh, I think this is why the government now are paying more attention to when they have this kind of big events. Uh, on the other hand, and this is what I mentioned uh, in the morning, uh, um, there's something else. Uh, it affects the way in which you conduct negotiations. Because negotiations, uh, you need to get the, set the consent of the, of the other international actors, but also the domestic support to ratify. So if someone penetrates your information environment with this kind of fake news, it can undermine your domestic support for a particular position. So I think, mm -hmm. beside the election, this is another moment when you are engaged in big international negotiation. Uh, one example I mentioned it was the US-Iran nuclear deal. Then Pay attention to your domestic environment because you know actors may, may try to derail that. Well, maybe a last word to, to Jan to wrap up the session. I will uh, just add a few conclusions and then I will done for, for a night. Only as brief as I can be that what we have learned in the past years 
um, since the opening of the digital age, which is where we still are, is that it is extremely hard to make predictions. Uh, the tone of the debate was so different in 2014 to compare to 2017. We simply don't know where we will be two years for, from now. So this also shows you that is, it's, it's a playing field where those who make decisions and people in government can perhaps prefer to tread very carefully. And this is where I'd like to bring in the cross-cultural dimension as well. Uh, we should not see as correct diplomatic behavior what Western diplomats are told to do by their superiors, how to behave in the digital environment. It's almost like Western foreign ministries keep scorecards of who is on Facebook and who are, who are active diplomats in social media, as, as if that's the new norm. Those same diplomats, you may wonder, are they following other diplomats? By whom are they being, being followed? And does that really, that, that presence in the social media realm, contribute in any productive way to the work that they are doing? I'm just throwing out these questions because I'm aware of the fact that there are so many other countries in the world where individual diplomats are not encouraged at all to be in the social media, are not being encouraged at all to display this kind of behavior, which appears to be a sort of a Western norm. And among those countries are countries with uh, more authoritarian societies, but also democratic countries that are technologically very advanced, like South Korea, where South Koreans have mm. come to the conclusion, well, the jury is still out as to what this all means and how we should use these tools in the conduct of international relations. So jumping to conclusions in this business can be costly because we have to adapt all the time how, yeah. we, how we understand uh, uh, the, uh, where we are. So thank you. We have been uh, hearing uh, very worrying stories this evening about fake news and uh, that stories of... Uh, I would say uh, misuse uh, and sorry of abuse, mistrust and everything. But uh, on the safe side, we, we can say also we have had a, a number of stories about how to fight the, the, the fake news. It, uh, there is a role, I think, for government, governments to play. There is a role for uh, te technology companies to play. And uh, all of them, medias, technology companies and governments must fight this, uh, this type of fake news. I would like to thank our two excellent panelists this evening, uh, Jan and, and Cornelius, for this excellent presentation and uh, the enlightening uh, the speech they have had both on, uh, on these uh, very interesting topics. Thank you. Thank you. And we can applaud to our